welcome to um, SAT from the official SAT study guide, test five, section two. Seems like we haven't been together forever. Uh, hopefully these videos help keep us connected and that you can learn a few new techniques for each video that I do. All right, we're gonna start out quickly because the beginning ones are supposed to be easy ones, right? So let's just see what we can do. All right. So 3x plus 9 equals 5x plus 1. Let's subtract 3x from both sides and subtract 1 from both sides. So 9 minus 1 is 8. 5x minus 3x is 2x. Divide both sides by 2, you get x equals 4. So we're going quickly. The first term in the sequence is 7, and each term after it, the first is determined by multiplying the preceding term by m and then adding p. What is the value of m? So they're actually asking, what are we going to multiply each term by um, and then add something 2 to get the next one. So it's pretty simple. It's a number 2. So if I take 7 times 2, I get 14, plus 1, I get 15. If I take 15 times 2, I get 30, plus 1 is 31. So obviously what we're multiplying each one by is going to be 2, so the answer is 2. If, if 2 didn't work, you would try 3, 4, etc. It's a number 2, so it's not going to be that difficult. All right, the table shows the different colors and sizes of t-shirts that are available at Independence High. How many different combinations? <clears throat> when they ask you the combination problem, you figure out how many of one and how many of the other, and you just simply multiply them together. The answer is 12. If that's not clear, just think of it. You could have a red small, a red medium, a red large, a red extra large. So there'd be four different um, shirt combinations with the red. And then the same for the white. So there'll be four different shirt combinations for the white and four for the blue. So that's going to be 12. <clears throat> if you can recognize, you just multiply them together. It'll save you tons of time, especially when it's a number three. It's an easier combination problem. All right. This looks scary, but it's a substitution problem. All we're going to do is put in the negative three in the function and compare it to what it's going to look like with the positive three. So let's just start out with A. Um, we're going to take 4 times negative 3. We're going to put it in this function, square it, and see if it's greater than when we put in the positive 3 and square it. So we're going to get um, 9 times 4, which is going to be the same as 9 times 4. So we're going to get 36. Um, <clears throat> so um, this one is not going to work. Any one where you have an even power is going to make the negative the same as the positive, so this one's not going to work either. Okay, this is a constant function, so you can't even evaluate it with the negative 3, so we're just going to cross that out. Let's go to C. So 4 over uh, uh, 3, negative 3, is that greater than 4 over positive 3? We're just putting it this in, and then we're putting this in. That would be right there. So no, a negative is never greater than a positive, so that's not going to work. The only one that is left is this one, but you guess you should check it. 4 minus a negative 3 cubed, is that greater than 4 um, minus a positive 3 cubed? And it is because we're going to get a 4 plus the negative and the negative. This is going to be um, 27 versus 4 minus 27. So this one is our winner. Okay, let's go to the next one. Um, <clears throat> it says if y is the midpoint of xz, which of the following must be true? So I like to draw a picture for these as much as possible. So let's do that. Did I skip one up here? Yes, I skipped one. Okay, the force required to stretch a spring beyond its natural length is proportional to how far the string is being, spring is being stretched. If the force, we'll call that force, um, of 15 pounds stretches the spring 8 centimeters, so we'll just put for centimeters, the force over the centimeters beyond its natural length, it tells you it's proportional, so we set up a proportion. Um, in pounds, um, what force, so we don't know the force, so we put x there to stretch it, centimeters goes in the bottom, equals 20. We just do a simple cross multiplication problem on this, Pro the cross multiplication on this, we're going to get 8x equals 300, divide both sides by 8, and we get 37.5. Okay, simple proportion. 
Just make sure you keep the forces on the top, centimeters on the bottom. Just stay consistent with that when you do proportions. All right, here we go back to this one. Um, we're going to draw the picture. Y is the midpoint of XZ. So here we go. Whoops, a little uphill. That's all right, though. It doesn't really matter. XZ. Um, y is the midpoint. Might be helpful to assign numbers. This whole thing, we'll call it 4. And so if it, Y is the midpoint, then this is 2 and this is 2. And then just go through and check and see if it, it's true. So is y, YZ, we know YZ would be 2, right? Is that equal to half of XZ? Well, XZ is 4. Half of XZ would be 2. Yes, it's true. All right, let's go to the next one. Half of XZ, well, XZ would be 2. Half of XZ would be 2. Um, 2 XY, what's XY? XY is 2. 2 times XY would be 4. That one does not work. Let's do the next last one. 2 XY. So here's XY. 2 times XY would be, um, whoops, I think I did this one wrong. Um, XZ. XZ is 4. 2 XY is 4. Let's see, 2 times xz. Okay, 2 times xz would be 8. That was wrong, but it was still wrong. Okay, um, actually it's half of xz. Half of xz is 2. Oh, darn. Um, okay, I was right the first time. Duh. Okay, onward. 2xy. So that would be 4 equals xz. xz would be 4. So that one is true. So the answer is 1 and 3. All right, next page. Okay. <clears throat> um, we've done ones like this before. 2R equals 5S and 5S equals 16. What does R equal in terms of T? So we're going to solve it for T once we get it. You can see this is the transitive property. If, if 2R equals 5S and 6T equals 5S, then... 2r is going to equal 6t. It's a transitive property. If this equals this, and this equals this, and this equals this, then these two are going to be equal. And then they, they want you to solve it for r, so you're going to say r equals 6t over 2, r equals 3t. So it's just substitution. You're going to end up connecting these two. They're going to be equal. So 3t is your answer. Okay, next one's a little bit more challenging here. Uh, total K passengers went on a bus trip. Each of the N buses that were used to transport the passengers could seat a maximum of X passenger. If one bus had three empty seats and the remaining buses were filled, which of the following would express the relationship among N, K, and N, X, and K? Okay, hopefully you had time to think this through, and this isn't the first time you're hearing this because I'm going to go quickly on this. Um, <clears throat> a couple ways you can look at this. I'm going to use, I'm just going to pick numbers. Okay, we're trying to figure out how many passengers, so that's not the one I'm going to pick. I'm going to pick the N and the X. So I'm going to use N for buses. I'm going to say there are five buses. And then I'm going to say um, there were 10 people per bus. So how many pa total passengers would there be all together? Well, that would be 50 passengers, right? All right. Um, because you would multiply the number of buses times people, except that there's three empty seats on one of the buses. So we're going to subtract off three because we have three empty seats. So it's going to be 47 passengers. So you can look. A works if you think about it because we're, well, all we did was we took N times K minus three, and that's what we have here. Or you can put your numbers back in. So you're going to get five. Oops, my zero went away. Times 10 minus 3 equals 47 passengers. So picking numbers works pretty well for a problem like that. All right, next page, next problem. All right, um, L is parallel to M. What's the value of X? Well, you have to know some things about parallel lines. If you have parallel lines, there's a couple things you need to know about that. Real quick lesson on that. And you have a transversal. So we're going to use this as our transversal. Um, 
if you have a transversal cutting your cutting through parallel lines, I'll just expand this a little bit, even though I can't draw a straight line for the life of me. Um, that's really bad. Let's get rid of that and try to draw a straight line here. All right, it's gray. That's the only problem with this. All right, uh, you have to know that the the interior angles they're not going to be equal, but they're going to add up to 180 degrees. That's the key for this. Um, you can also say um, alternate interior angles are congruent, and you'll ha also know that um, the one with two here and the one with one slash are going to equal 180 as well. So if we go with just the fact one that the interior angles add up to 180, this one's going to be 100. Um, we also know that uh, angles that lie on the same line add up to 180. So 100 plus 50 plus 30 is going to add up to 180. And then we know that um, this is a straight line, K is. So these two angles are linear pairs, so this one has to be 150. So that's the fast version on that one as well. All right, next one. For what values of x is the statement false? I like to start out, um, uh, I think it's always easier to start out with the easy numbers and then maybe you get lucky and it works and you don't have to do the more complicated numbers. So let's just pick 0. If I put 0 in for x, I'm going to get 0 because 3 times 0 is 0 is less than 3 times 0 squared is 0. Is that true? No, it's not. So there you go. That's our answer. That just saves you a little bit of time when you start at 0 and 1. I mean, I could do show you how easy 1 is too. 3 times 1 is 3. Is 3 less than 3 times 1 squared, which would be 9? Yep. So this one's actually true. So this is our answer right here, B. Yep. Start with the zeros and 1s. It helps. It'll make things get a little faster if they work. If they don't work, you didn't waste that much time. So that's the advantage to that. All right. Trying to get through all these before my house destructs this morning. It's Saturday morning. Okay, Senai customized her bicycle by exchanging by exchanging uh, the front wheel for a wheel that had only half the diameter of the back wheel. Now when she rides her bicycle, how many revolutions does the front wheel make for each revolution of the back wheel? So let's just draw two wheels, circle and a circle. Um, she, she's a really uneven bike here. Um, here's the back wheel. Okay, the diameter of this one, let's just call it two, and we'll call the diameter of this one four. Now we're talking about circumference, the time that it goes around. So I'm going to figure out the circumference of each of these and then just compare them. So um, circumference is two pi r. So this one's going to be four pi. And the circumference the whole way around on this one is going to be, um, we have 2 pi r, so it's going to be 2 times 4, it's going to be 8 pi. Um, I didn't actually do the right thing here. Yes, I didn't. Um, r is 1, duh. So it's going to be 2 times pi times 1, and this one's going to be 2 times, or you could do pi times the diameter. It's the same idea. Um, pi times 2. So this is going to be 2 pi um, and this is going to be 4 pi. So how many times is the front wheel going to go around for each revolution in the back wheel? It's going to go around two times. That one really didn't take much work. You didn't have to do as much work as I did. You could also do um, circumference equals um, pi times the diameter, which would have been faster. Okay. A little bit harder. A list of number consists of p positive and n negative numbers. If the number picked at random from the list, the probability that the number is positive is 3 over 5. What's the value of n over p? Well, let's just set up a little ratio chart. We have the positive numbers, the negative numbers, numbers, and the total. Okay, um, 3 out of 5 is positive, so the positive would be 3. The total would be 5. The number of negative numbers would be 2. They want to know n over p. Well, it's going to be 2 over 3. And I know that made, I made it look super, super easy there. I mean, I've done it algebraically as well, but this is just so much easier. Um, if it's going to give you a total 
it's, it's telling us that it's three out of five. Then when you do your little ratio chart, um, you have the to use the total, use the T. And then you could just fill in the negatives because three plus two have to equal five. So the value of N over P is just two over three. Okay, this one looks really bad, but it's not that bad at all. So the total daily cost C in dollars of preceding X units of a certain product, so it's X units, is given by the function here where K is a constant and X is less than 100, and equal to 100. They give you so much information on this just to make it more complicated. They're just saying if 20 units were produced, so instead of X, we're going to put the 20. It's just a simple substitution problem involving algebra. So we're going to figure out the cost of 20 units, 600 times 20 minus 200 all over 20. You put the 20 in for all the x's plus k. They want to know what's the value of k, so if we just figure this out, um, we're pretty much going to have it here. Um, so I'm going to... Um, you could, like I did without a calculator, I did this as 20 times 10. I would just use your calculator and do this, and then all the 20s cancel out. And we get um, 600 minus 10 is 580 plus K. Um, let's see, if 20 were produced yesterday and the total cost of 640, um, I want to put the 640 over here, total cost is 640. Um, the value of K would just be, we're going to subtract 540, I mean, yeah, 580 from both sides. And so we're going to get K equals uh, 50. So this is just a substitution. The total cost is 640. The X's are 20, so the answer is 50. Okay, moving right along. This seems like a slow SAT. How many ordered pairs of positive integers is for how many for how many ordered pairs of positive integers is this true? So um, what they're testing is that you know what positive integers are. First positive integer is one. So it doesn't say they have to x and y have to be different. So I'm just going to take one one. It's my first positive integer and put it in and see if it makes it true. 2 times 1 plus 3 times 1 is less than 6. Uh, is that true? Uh, 2 plus 3 is 5. 5 is less than 6. So this one, so it is definitely that one works. Okay, let's go up a little bit more. I'm going to change x to 2. 2 and 1. So 2 times 2 plus 3 times 1 is that less than 6. So we get 4 plus 3 is not less than 6. So we can't go up anymore. We um, went up the minimum amount, so there's only one ordered pair that works. Pretty tricky. You can't use zero. Zero is neither positive or negative, but it is even. Okay, keep that in mind. It's really important. The definitions, they get you on those kind of things. All right, next one. All right, um, this is a fun little guy. Um, if y equals 60, how much greater is the perimeter of ABC than the perimeter of DEF? Okay, um, we know that this side is the same as this side because sides opposite equal angles are equal. Um, they're telling us this is 60, and if this is 60, that's 120. 120 from 180 gives us 60. So you can see it's an equal lateral triangle because all the angles are the same. All the sides have to be the same. So this side's going to be 5, and this side's going to be 5, and so the perimeter of this, this triangle is going to be 15. Now, how can we move to find the perimeter of this? Same thing. We don't need to know the angles, but we know that the sides opposite equal angles are equal. So if the side opposite this one is 8, the side opposite the same x is going to be 8. So we add those up, to, uh, those up and we get 21. 8 plus 8 plus 5 is 21. And we subtract the 2. Um, keep going. It says um, how much greater. So they don't really give you these bad choices to throw you off. But um, how much greater is going to be 6. Um, just keep in mind if it's equilateral, all the sides are the same. And sides opposite equal angles are going to be equal. 
All right, x and y are positive consecutive odd integers, where y is greater than x, which of the following is equal to y squared minus x squared. All right, I'm just picking numbers. I've done this algebraically, but let's just pick numbers. Positive consecutive odd numbers. So we're going to go with 3 and 5. Um, x is going to have to equal 3, and y is going to equal 5, because it says right here y is greater than x. These are positive consecutive odd numbers. These are consecutive odd numbers like this. All right? We picked our numbers. Now we're going to put it in here, y squared minus x squared. So y squared minus, oops, x squared. I'll just keep going there. So we're going to get 25 minus 9 is going to give us 16. And we're just going to see which one this works for. So if I take 2 times x, I get 6. That doesn't work. 4 times 3 gives me 12. That doesn't work. Um, 2 times 3 is... 6 plus 2, um, that doesn't work either. Um, we're going to find out that 4 times x um, plus 4 gives us 12 plus 4 is 16. This is our winner. So again, knowing to pick numbers is going to be clutch for a lot of these problems. We've done several like that so far. All right. The, this one's a little tricky. <laughs> In the xy plane, a line L passes through the origin. All right. So we got line L passing through the origin. It's perpendicular to this line. This line is 4x. We're going to manipulate this in a minute. Equals k, where k is a constant. All right. So um, uh, if the two lines intersect at this point, what is the value of t? Yikes. OK. First thing, we know line L is, passes through the origin. So line L, we're going to do line little line L down here. Line L has the point 0, 0. It passes through the origin. And we can find the slope of line L by figuring out the slope of um, this other line that doesn't get a letter. So we're going to solve this. We're going to get y equals negative 4x uh, plus k. So the slope of this line is negative 4. The other line, line L, passes through the origin, and it's perpendicular to this line, so its slope is going to be line L slope is going to be um, one fourth, positive one fourth. Okay, yes. We can actually write the equation for line L, having these, th knowing these things. Because if you think about it, line L is going to go through the origin, which means its y intercept is zero. It's going to go up one and over four. So we don't, we really didn't need to draw anything for this guy. Okay. We can write the equation for this line. Um, we know it's going to be y equals 1 fourth, that's its slope, x plus 0 because the y-intercept is 0. This point right here, I'm going to run out of room for this problem. I think I'm going to move right on over here, okay? Okay, this point is where the two lines, I don't know where the other line is, but just say it goes through here because it's perpendicular. This point right here is going to lie on both lines. That point is t and t plus 1. When it says it intersects that, it means it lies on both lines. It's a really bad t. So that means that this point right here can go in to this equation and make it true because that point lies on that line. So this is your x, this is your y, and I'm going to substitute it into this equation. So y. Let's just rewrite the equation. y equals 1 fourth x. So y is t plus 1, and x is just t. Now we have one equation, one variable. We can solve it. I'm going to multiply everything by 4 because I like to get rid of fractions. Plus 4 equals t. Subtract, um, let's subtract 4t from both sides. So we get 4 equals negative 3t. Divide both sides by negative 3, and guess what? We have it. t is equal to negative 4 thirds. This one was a little bit tricky. Um, you don't really need this equation except to get Mr. Slope. And then once you get the slope, you need to find the perpendicular slope is the negative reciprocal. So if this slope is negative 4, the negative reciprocal is going to be positive 1 fourth. And that's that. That was a little hard have to admit it. Okay, back to our average problems. If the average 
of x and y is k, which, what is the following of x, y, and z? Okay, so we talked about averages before. x plus y um, divided by 2 is equal to k. That's how we figure out averages. Um, if it says the average of x and y is k, then we know that there's 2, so we divide by 2. So we know that x plus y is going to equal 2k. Now we want to find the value of x plus y plus z. So we're going to be dividing it by 3. We're going to figure out whatever the average is. We know that x plus y is equal to 2k. So I'm going to replace this x plus y with a 2k. So look what we get. 2k plus z over 3. And that looks like a. So just remember, you can always figure out what this is by multiplying the how many numbers times the average. And then I just substituted it in, and it got what we're looking for. All right, that was a little tricky, too. All right, last group of problems. OK, where is it? Huh. Oh, there it is. OK. All right, in the figure, we have a triangle, x, y, z. It says it's equilateral with a side length of 2. So here we go. We're going to use some of our 30, 60, 90 triangle thing. Um, all the sides are 2. Um, x, y is a diameter of the circle. What is the area? So to find the area of a circle, we know it's pi r squared. So we need to know what r is to find the area. <clears throat> Uh, it says it's equilateral, so this is really important that you remember equilateral triangles are 60-60-60s, and this is going to bisect it, so it's going to be 30. Um, we know that because we have a 60 here, we have a 90 here, so to be add up to 180, it has to equal 30 up there. My, my things look really awful here, 60. I'm not going to put the degrees in just to make it easier. Okay. Now we have ourselves the 30, 60, 90 triangle. This is going to be 1. Um, then we can remember that the side opposite the 60 is whatever the side opposite the 30 is times the square root of 3. So this is just going to be the square root of 3 right here. Remember that if you have our triangle 30, 60, 90, 30, 60, 90. If this is x, this is 2x, and this is x times the square root of 3. So figure out the one opposite the 30, and then just take it times the square root of 3. We have the one opposite the 30 is 1. 1 times the square root of 3 is square root of 3. From here, it's a piece of cake. We get pi. The radius would be half of the diameter. I'm sure the answer is over there that has um, the diameter itself squared. So we're going to get 3 fourths pi. And that's going to be this answer right there. Yeah, right here they, they have all kinds of versions of what you could have gotten. So you're going to divide it by 2 to get the radius, because this is square root of 3 is the whole diameter. Divide it by 2 and square it. All right. We've done this one before, but I will do it again, because it is so much fun. Okay, when 15 is divided by, I like to set my little things up by positive integer k, the remainder is 3. Well, you can figure out k by subtracting 15, um, take away minus 3, and you get 12. So k is going to, one value is going to be k is equal to 12. And you can try that out. 15, and we're going to divide it by 12. What happens? We get, do get a remainder of 3. So 12 is one of our answers. Once you get the first one, you can see if I doubled 12 and got 24, it's never going to go in. So we have to always, we're going to find numbers less than 12. So I'm going to take 12, whatever that is, and I'm going to find out all the factors of this. So I could have um, 2 times 6, and I could have 3 times 4. I'm going to try all the factors. You can never have a number less than the remainder, so 2 is already out. You can never have a number that divides evenly. If we did 3, it would go evenly into 15, so that's out. 6 and 4... These are going to be your three answers, but you can try them. 15 divided by 6 is going to be 12, remainder of 3. And 15 divided by 4, it's going to go in three times. You're going to get 12 with a remainder of 3. 
Um, so those are all the different ones that work. So there are three different answers. Once you get the first one, then you're just going to figure out the factors to figure out the other ones. All right, so that is it for uh, test five, section two.